The seven deadly sins are more of a Christian construct than a specific biblical list, per se. They originated with the Desert Fathers, particularly Evagrius of Pontus, who, in the 4th century, listed eight evil thoughts, not sins, that one needed to overcome. Later, Pope Gregory I would revise this list to seven in the 6th century, categorizing them more along the lines of what we're familiar with today. Pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth. Now, if you're flipping through your Bible trying to find a passage where these seven are listed out, you are going to be scanning those thin pages for a long time. That's because they aren't laid out in a convenient bullet-pointed section. However, you can find scriptures that discuss behaviors and vices that align with the seven deadly sins. They're sprinkled throughout various books, echoing sentiments that capture the spirit of each sin. For instance, Proverbs is chock full of wisdom about greed and pride, whereas Paul's letters touch on issues of lust and envy. One of the closest you get to a list is in Galatians 5.19, 21, where Paul reels off the acts of the flesh, which cover a similar territory. Sexual immorality, idolatry, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, along with others. They don't directly translate to the classical list of seven, but you can see where the early church fathers started connecting the dots. And let's not forget the ever-so-ominous Book of Revelation, which, in chapter 21, verse 8, gives us a rundown of the sorts of folks that won't be entering the pearly gates. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those practicing magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars. So, while there isn't a single spot where the seven deadly sins are neat and tidied up, their influence is felt throughout the Bible, in the fabric of Christian moral teachings. I don't live far from Powell's City of Books here in Portland, Oregon, that monumental fortress of literature, where I can wander and thumb through theological texts and ancient scriptures. It's places like this, corners of quiet contemplation, or heated debate with the local armchair philosopher, where one can delve into these subjects deeper. And as I step out, I can't help but mull over how these seven old notions of vice continue to resonate through time and somehow find new relevance in each generation.